Chapter 4 of the Bhagavad Gita from which this commentary was taken, this one line, a couple of lines, the whole chapter is all about the different ways that we can offer ourselves to God. Um, It's talking about uh, yagya, which is fire ceremony, but it is really talking symbolically about the inner choices that we are always faced with. And it's a very important chapter in the Gita, and it's a very important commentary here. Uh, When we think about sacrifice, that word implies from the ego's perspective that something painful is going to happen and something that we want is going to be taken away from us. It's a bit of an awkward word. Um, for that reason, because we don't have an immediate, generally speaking, we don't have an immediately positive response to it. Um, Certain um, ancient biblical stories, especially when I was in Israel, as you all know, a month ago, um, our guide was an American Israeli, uh, transported, and uh, very knowledgeable about the Old Testament, and we heard a lot about the Old Testament. The Old Testament is a one tough document, is about all I can say. I read through it at one point and I just became exhausted with everybody smiting everybody and then God getting into the act. And I, at the end of it, what I felt was that there's a lot of deep teaching here, but I think I'll try to find it somewhere else. <laughs> and was grateful, as I always am, for Master's teaching where he just says it. If you, you know, for God's sake, just say it. And he just says it in very more direct words. And Swami's commentary on the Bhagavad Gita says it all much more clearly in direct words. There's the famous story in the Old Testament of Abraham and Isaac, which is one of the very beginning stories. As it happens, I saw a great piece of art in the Israeli Museum commemorating that moment, so it's very vivid in my mind. Abraham is the great prophet and the context at that time was animal sacrifice. I don't really know if there was as much animal sacrifice as we think there was, because animal sacrifice is incredibly barbaric. And how, how can taking the life of some innocent creature, slitting its throat and having the poor thing bleed all over the altar, what kind of a god are you pleasing? Um, words change their meaning, and sometimes things are spoken of symbolically, And then in later generations, we don't even know. We had Kali Yuga completely hitting its nadir and coming up the other side between us and all of those stories. And I'm I'm very suspicious. In the ancient Vedas, there's the word, I think the word is go. And it's always translated as cows. But its actual original meaning, as I understand it, was light. So you would have all these great sages whose greatness was measured by how big their herd of cows was. And you're just like, there's a slight disconnect here, but if the actual word at that time meant light, then of course the whole thing makes sense. But anyway, going back to Abraham and Isaac, supposedly, you know, what God wanted from him was to sacrifice some major goat of some kind. But in fact, God asked him to sacrifice his own son, Isaac. And so you have this uh, very intense story told of Abraham taking his son Isaac and they're going up onto the mountain and they're going to make a sacrifice. And they have the fire things that they need and all the implements that they need, but Isaac notices that there's no goat. And he asks his father or inquires of his father and his father Abraham simply assures him that it's going to be all right, this is what's going to be asked of him. And they go up the mountain, and Abraham is taking his son up the mountain, knowing in his own heart that he feels he's been asked to give, give up his son. And so the fire is laid, the faggots are there, everything is ready, and all of a sudden Isaac realizes that it's he himself who is the sacrifice. And he's bound, and Abraham raises his sword and is seemingly ready to do this, and then the angel of the Lord comes down and grabs his wrist like this. And then there appears caught in the bush 
a perfectly appropriate goat or sheep. And that's how the story ends. The art that I saw, which uh, I can't remember the name of the artist. What's the name of the artist? Simon Troger. Simon Troger. You can look it up on the internet. It's beautiful. It's an ivory carving with ebony wood. And he uses glass for the eyes and actual metal. It's an exquisite piece. And you have it. Isaac is bound. You see the animal over here. You see the fire laid. Abraham has his arm raised like this. And then you have the angel, and the angel hasn't quite grabbed Abraham's hand. So what you see is all that power in place, but it hasn't quite shifted. Now, it's a pretty awful God that would ask you to take up and slit the throat of your own son, isn't it? And uh, it makes atheists out of a lot of people to read about things like that. And we certainly look around this world, and we see lots of places where Really horrific things are happening. But when we come to our teaching, from joy I came, for joy I live, and Master says, a tiny bubble of laughter, I have become the sea of mirth itself. Everything is about this freedom. Swami Kriyananda writes, toward the end of his life, I've quoted this many times, but it, it's a very important uh, quote. He says, it's, it's natural for people as they age, and he was in his late 80s by that point, it's natural as people age to more and more repudiate this world. Partly one does that out of sheer exhaustion and out of the transition of the generations where the young people don't seem to have any appreciation for the world that I grew up in, which is a temptation I'm fighting myself right now. And, but also... uh, a natural kind of world weariness sets in. You just see the same repeating heartbreaks over and over. And it's very hard to maintain your open-hearted enthusiasm. So Swami remarked, it's, it's natural to repudiate. But Swami said, I find my consciousness is going the other direction. He said, I'm more and more conscious of the presence of God everywhere, behind everything. He said, and wherever God is present, that's heaven itself, isn't it? Isn't that just a beautiful way to look at it? But of course, that doesn't change the facts. That doesn't change the suffering and the heartbreak that seems to come with life, one way or another. So what has happened is that in a desire to embrace the joy We've tried to just push away this whole concept of sacrifice. And it's, it's, um, it's become very popular to think that we can have it all. We can please God, we can um, be beautiful and sexy, we can be rich, we can have all the stuff that we want, we can be forever young, and if God is everywhere, then God is in all of these things that I want. And it's not a bad experiment when young people asked Swamiji in the 70s what his concept of what was called then the sexual revolution was, I mean, you would think a man representing such an ancient tradition who was himself a monk would have something to say in favor of traditional morality. His response is, well, I think it's altogether a good idea. And then he qualified that by saying, not in itself. You know, the breakdown of... uh, Traditional morality is nothing to celebrate. But he said people are making their own experience the criteria of their values. And that is something to celebrate. Because if we're good merely because the social consequences of being bad are so intense, that doesn't really mean that we're good. That just means we're afraid. And fear and freedom are our antithesis. They can't be the same. So what we have to do is we have to make our own experience the guide for how we decide what's true. But that experience has to be more than a minute long. And that experience also has to to involve respect for those, both, both scriptures and living beings, whose wisdom your experience gives you reason to respect. This is where 
I feel myself having had so many years with Swami Kriyananda. I didn't always agree with what he said, and I many times had, didn't have the foggiest idea what he was doing. But my experience had told me that he was trustworthy. And I had that directly, but you can read autobiography, you can see Master's picture, you can read the Bible, and you can feel there's something trustworthy here. And all spiritual stories speak of this necessity to make an effort. That if we just follow the, 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 the lowest, easiest path, just go wherever the energy is flowing, well, we'll flow, but where will we end up? And this is where experience has to be our teacher. We have to look at... Uh, um, one of the ways you can tell if a path is really yours or not. It's, it's sometimes hard to, to evaluate a guru because what criteria do we use? How can we tell? And Swamiji also said something very amusing. He said, many um, people who call themselves gurus are good actors, he said. So the way you can really tell is by, to look at those who have followed this path with their whole heart and then see who they are, and see if they are who you want to become. And so he said, many of the so-called gurus are good actors, but not all the disciples are good actors. That's how he put it. (laughs) The facade will crack, or the picture will be proven true. And then you can tell whether or not this is, and this is part of your experience, is to trust your own judgment, not just your judgment about yourself, but what you're seeing. And every path tells us that discipline is required and every impulse is not an impulse that will lead to true happiness. And that's where the word sacrifice comes in. And of course, the story of Abraham and Isaac is just stunningly dramatic because what is, what greater attachment is there than a parent for his child, a man for his son, And at least symbolically, God is saying, even this you must be willing to give up. And naturally, our experience is highly challenged. You know, what good could come of that? But sometimes when something is pushed to the end point, then we get to test ourselves against it. One of the great temptations on the spiritual path is to make the teaching is to lower the teaching to something that we feel more comfortable with and so that we can feel like we're standing taller in relation to it. And one of the great challenges on the spiritual path is to be able to realize just how high the mountain is and yet still be comfortable wherever we're walking. And Swami was asked once, you know, how much discipline is enough discipline? You know, how much should I do battle with myself. He says, that what you can do with joy. He said, if you've begun to, f- to resent what's being asked of you or to find that your reality is only this great sense of deprivation, he says, back up a little. And it's not that that other teaching isn't true. Um, God did not ask everyone to sacrifice their own son. He only asked this great prophet and he pushed him right to the edge to see what was he asking him? How much faith do you have? Faith in God's wisdom? Faith in your own capacity to know that you're hearing really the voice of God and that if you follow it, the power will be there? And that's what we face every day. What's being asked of me? Where does my happiness come from? How can I live really in harmony with God's will? And in our, the rest of our reading today, the, the whole emphasis there is on the importance of our being able to be clear. Not just vaguely something is going to happen, something is being asked of me, or I really don't like this, this must be God's will, or I really do like it, it must be God's will, both of which are equally false. But simply to be able to be clear enough to know who I am, where I stand, what I really feel, 
how, how weak or strong I actually am. You know, many times we try to, what I call, work out someone else's karma because our own karma is just too mundane for us. You know, the actual curbing of our anger, giving up of our impatience, uh, being generous-hearted to the people around us who often don't behave in the way that we think they ought to behave, really learning to see each other as God actually sees us, this is not easy. This is Abraham sacrificing his son. Because the real child, our, our, our beloved child that has to be sacrificed, our physical offspring, it's not that. It's our, it's our own selves. It's, it's my own self, my own precious habit, my own attachment, my own deep self-identification with being this certain way. And what God wants of us is to sacrifice all of that. But sacrifice is really not the right word. The word is to, to, to free ourselves from. When you sacrifice something, it's like you still want it. And where the joy and the, the, the pasia, the austerity come together, is when we realize that the more we give to God, the more we surrender all of these limited self-definitions and these false beliefs that this is what I have to have to be happy, then there's no sacrifice. Where is the sacrifice? In Autobiography of a Yogi, there's this wonderful little moment when uh, the levitating saint is uh, talking to Master. And levitating saint is a complete renunciate, Baduri Mahashaya. And Yogananda says to him, I understand you gave up great wealth in order to live the life that you're living. And the, the great sage looks at him and he says, a handful of rupees, he said, for an infinity of bliss. And that's not always easy to persuade ourselves that what we're giving up is just a handful of rupees for infinity of bliss. And that's where our own experience, day after day after day after day. And there's no other way. That's why the Gita says those who do not partake of the fruit of the sacrifice, which is to say those who do not make the effort to live in harmony with God's will never receive the fruit of that. And if we don't make that effort, then God can't come to us. He can only come to us when we open our hearts. That's the irony of the whole thing is that even though we say we want this, or we fear that God's going to intervene, there is a perfect balance between our receptivity and his response. And the the key to that balance is not in God's hands, but it's in ours. How much do I really want? How much courage do I really have? How much will I open my heart? How much of my habit will I sacrifice? My, how many handfuls of rupees will I cast into the fire for the infinity of bliss? God bless you.